Long after the episode, Lennox asked the princess whether she was prepared to spend the rest of her life coping with the press. Her answer was telling in its naivete. She said, oh, Mr. Lennox, Prince Andrew will get married and I'll be forgotten about and there'll be a new woman on the scene. And I said, I don't think that's going to be the case. In truth, Diana would be hounded by the press for the rest of her life. I had a very bad time with the press because they literally haunted me and hunted me. Haunted and hunted, Diana struggled to cope with feelings the press would know nothing about, but which would shape the rest of her life and their coverage of it. When we return, Princess Diana reveals her secret torment. The life of a princess was turning out to be anything but a fairy tale, though few people knew how far from enchanted it was, until Diana made these tapes years later. Tapes heard tonight for the first time ever in public, revealing how deeply unhappy she had been. One minute I was neighbor, the next minute I was Princess of Wales, mother, media, toy, member of this family, you name it. And it was just too much for one person at that time. Yeah. The outgoing, fun-loving girl that caught Charles' eye and captivated the nation tried her best to keep up appearances, flashing that million-dollar red carpet smile. But behind closed doors, Diana said she was retreating into her shell. I didn't know what to do anything on my own. I was too frightened. I mean, the thought of reading it on my own sent tremors. So I stuck with whatever Charles did, but the pace was phenomenal. It didn't get easier. I just got used to what people were required from the Princess of Wales. What Diana thought wasn't going to come into it yet, because I hadn't got enough background. She felt desperately insecure. I hated myself so much. I didn't think I was good enough. I thought that was good enough for Charles. Oh, that's as long as I was going to I always used to think people would just look at me with my clothes, and I was desperate for the other side to come up or, or to be dealt with. I didn't know how to do it. Later on those secret tapes, Diana would rail against Charles' lack of support. My husband made me feel so um, inadequate in every possible way, but each time I came up for air, he pushed me down again. I'll tell you this, if Prince Charles had said to her from day one, well done, on a regular basis, she would never have left the royal family. I'm really delighted that uh, my wife has been able to come as well. Far from being distant and uncaring, his supporters say the prince was deeply concerned about his wife. He did all sorts of things to try and make her happy, and it made no difference whatsoever. And Diana was so needy that what she actually required was 100% of, of somebody's attention. The bulimia first apparent during her engagement by now was out of control. And I wasn't well at all. I told everybody I was tired of her, but it was the bulimia that totally taken grip of me. Suddenly in the middle of dinner, I got sick and come back again. And they say, why didn't you go off to bed? And I felt it's my duty to sit at the table. I didn't, I mean, duty was all over the shop. I didn't know which way to turn at all. Soon, says James Colthurst, her eating disorder was a well-known fact in the royal household. The bulimia was evident, I think, to anybody who'd known her before and then subsequently saw her, and she became thinner and thinner. But for the millions fascinated by her every move, Diana was still the glamorous princess. It was an irony not lost on Diana herself. The public side was very different, obviously, from the private side. The public side, they wanted a fairy princess and come and touch them and everything would turn to gold, and all their worries would be forgotten. Little did they realize that the, that the individual was crucifying herself inside because she knew she was going up. Eventually, the bulimia began to take a toll in public. On this 1986 trip to Canada, Diana fainted while touring an exhibition with her husband. I touring an exhibition with her husband. I never fainted before in my life, and we'd been walking around for four hours, we hadn't had any food. I presume I hadn't eaten for days beforehand. By when I say that, I mean the food staying down. And I remember walking around feeling really ghastly, and I didn't dare tell him why I felt ghastly. And I put my arm on my husband's shoulder and I said, um, darling, I think I'm about to disappear, and slid down the side of him. The incident was quickly papered over as fatigue. 
Officials in Vancouver are blaming heat and fatigue for the fainting spell Princess Diana suffered. But the reaction behind the scenes was acid, Diana recalled. My husband told me off. He said I could have passed out quietly somewhere else behind the door. It was all very embarrassing. And inside me, I knew there was something wrong with me, but um, it was too immature to voice it. My wife is feeling much better now than uh, she was earlier this afternoon. New Year's 1982. Just five months into their marriage, pregnant Diana was feeling wretched. Their relationship continued to unravel. She felt Charles was incapable of understanding her turmoil. She threatened to take her own life. Charles was crying wolf, and I said I just felt so desperate, and I was crying my eyes out. And he said, I'm not going to listen, you're always doing this to me. He said, I'm going riding now. So I threw myself down the stairs, bearing in mind I was carrying a child. Queen comes out. Absolutely horrified, shaky. She's so frightened. I knew I wasn't going to lose the baby. Quite bruised around the start. And Charles went out riding. And when he came back, you know, it was just dismissal. Total dismissal. It was one of several half hearted suicide attempts she would make over the next decade. She revealed on the tapes that she had tried to cut her wrists and had thrown herself into a glass cabinet at Kensington Palace. Biographer Andrew Morton was stunned when he heard the revelations. I found them literally unbelievable because here she was, being the most photographed woman in the world, nursing these scars to her body that she'd obviously made in the kind of rage that she felt. And I think this is something that also comes over, this fury that she has, that she's been conned, she's been lured into this palace, the doors have been bolted behind her and she's got no way out. At another point in the mid-80s, Diana returned to London early from the royal family's annual stay in Scotland. The media said I'd come down so I was bored of all the rain up in Scotland and I wanted to go shopping. It was absolute bull****. I was very ill. We were trying to hide that from everybody. I had to come down for treatment because I was so depressed and I was trying to cut my wrist with razor blades. And she recalled another incident. After five years of being married, my sister Jane came up to see me and I had a v-neck on and um, shorts. She said, Dutch, what's that marking on your chest? And I said, oh, it's nothing. She said, what is it? And the night before, I wanted to talk to Charles about something. He wouldn't listen to me, so I was crying wolf. So I picked up his pen knife off his dressing table and um, scratched myself heavily mm. down my chest and my both, both thighs. And there was a lot of blood. And it hadn't made any reaction whatsoever. Suicide attempts are desperate calls for help. It didn't much matter, Diana said. No one was listening. I was just so desperate. I knew what was wrong with me, but nobody else around me understood me. I needed rest and to be looked after inside my house and for people to understand the torment and the anguish going on in my head. Mm, desperate cry for help, and I'm not spoiled. I just need to be allowed to adapt to my new position. Diana would eventually adapt, but not before things got much, much worse. When we return, Diana recounts her darkest days. From outside the palace gates, spring 1982 appeared idyllic as the royal couple awaited their first child. 